Tonight, as we continue the um, Wrath of God section of Daniel's 70th week, we are going to be looking at the second and third trumpets and vials, which are in Revelation chapter number 8 and Revelation chapter number 16. Um, last week, we looked at the first trumpet and the first vial, and if you remember from Revelation chapter 15, the vials actually contain the wrath of God, and the trumpet kind of announces the wrath, and then it's poured out, all right? So... Um, I don't know that it really matters to picture it that way, but the trumpets and vials go together. And it's very obvious that the trumpets and vials go together with the second and third uh, trumpets. And I'm also going to show you why um, I put the second and third together in one sermon, because they're very similar and they're very, um, they have a lot of things in common. So look down at Revelation chapter number 8 and look at verse number 8. Let's look at the second angel here. So we're in the wrath of God. We're in the second half of Daniel's 70th week. We have been raptured. We are out of here um, if this happens in our lifetime, or the Christians, the believers, have been raptured. Um, they're gone. They're watching all of this um, from heaven. Look at verse number 8 of Revelation chapter 8. The Bible says, And the second angel sounded, as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. So here the Bible is talking about, well, first of all, before we even get into this, let me just, you know, this is a really cool Bible study and a really cool sermon series. I really enjoy, um, like, looking through these sermons and studying for these sermons, and I hope you enjoy the sermons themselves. But I want you to picture um, when we're reading through this and studying through this, this is actually happening, all right? This is actually happening on the earth. If you look at, uh, remember the first vial, and the, the first trumpet and the first vial, it said that a third part of the trees were burnt up and all of the green grass. So it's not like a third of the grass and a third of the trees. It was all of the trees. It was a third of the trees and all of the grass. Okay, so massive fire on the earth. All right. So this is a major thing that is happening globally here. All right. And look at uh, verse number eight and verse number nine. We see this mountain burning with fire. You know, like it's not my intention or, you know, goal of the sermon series to predict exactly what this is. Is this like a, a super volcano or something? You know, it kind of sounds like a volcano um, to me, but the point is it's affecting the ocean. All right. It's affecting the ocean. If you look at verse number 10, um, the Bible continues. It says, now the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So a Wormwood, you know, is a, is a bitter plant, and uh, there's this star that falls out of heaven and basically poisons all of the rivers, all of the waters, all right? And if you look at verse, six, or verse 4 of Revelation chapter 16, the Bible says the, the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. All right, so we're definitely seeing a similarity here between the second trumpet, second vial, and third trumpet, third vial, having to do with the ocean and, and the sea in the second one, and then the other waters, specifically defined in verse number four as, you know, rivers and fountains of waters. All right, what, what are those? I mean, what are fountains of waters? Well, fountains of waters are water from the ground. I mean, it's, it's springs. I don't know if you've ever seen a spring. I know my, my father-in-law, at one place on his ranch, he literally had like a pipe just shoved into the side of this, this, this cliff, like where they knew like there was a spring of water and like this pipe would just constantly just run water. Because there was a spring under there and he knew it was there, so they just dug a pipe in, and they just harnessed that spring. So there's fountains of waters underneath us. It's basically like underground rivers. Think about aquifers, right? Underground water. This is what we do. We dig wells down to water tables, wherever they are, and we pull out these waters from the fountains of waters, all right? Look at the verse number 5. Now, verse number 5 of Revelation 16, we get a little bit of detail on why the water is turned to blood here. Um, obviously, um, we're going to look at, you know, the, the practical, you know, effect of that in just a few minutes. But it says, you know, there's symbolism to why God is doing this. It says, I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. 
So this is a judgment upon the waters, so to speak. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. All right, so this judgment upon the waters is really a judgment upon the men remaining on the earth, and it has a symbolic meaning because these men that remain on the earth killed the saints. They killed, you know, not just in the tribulation, but throughout all history, you know, God's people, you know, believers in Jesus Christ have been persecuted by men, by unbelievers on the earth. So that's why, that's the symbolism of the water being turned to blood. All right, so look, we see the second uh, trump and vial is the oceans, and the third trump and vial are the rivers and fountains. Essentially being turned to blood, but essentially being poisoned. Being poisoned, being made useless. So the title of the sermon tonight is basically Judgment Upon the Waters of the Earth. That's what the second and third vials and trumpets are all about. From the sea, to the rivers, to the fountains, wells, underground water, whatever you want to look at. Look, I mean, what we call it in California is surface and, you know, well water, right? So all waters are being affected here. It's basically, but here's the thing. Picture this for just a moment. Yes, I get that it turned to blood. You know, that happened with Pharaoh as well. You know, the Bible says in Revelation, it's interesting that in Revelation chapter 11, we're not talking about the two witnesses tonight, but the two witnesses that are going to be present during the wrath of God, one of the, one of the things that they're able to do is what? Turn water into blood. All right? So it's a judgment upon men to make the water poisonous, make the water useless. You say, why is that? Because water is used for literally everything. Water is one of the most important, if not the most important things on the planet. And here God is kind of cursing the earth in his wrath here. He cursed the earth itself, but now he's literally taking the water from people in a, in a symbolic way that shows why he's doing it. Because you persecuted my saints because you killed the prophets. Look, without water, literally nothing can thrive. I mean, not even your body. What is the human body? 80% water or something crazy like that? We're all water. In, in two days, if you don't have water, three days, you're dead if you don't have water. You know, water is, I was talking to one of the guys uh, yesterday, and one of the guys had a great point. We were talking about, I, I kind of spilled out my sermon yesterday. Um, on, on the construction site. But, you know, I was talking to um, the guys about just the amazing properties. I, actually, Brother Luke brought up water to me. I didn't even mention water, but he brought up water to me. And we were just talking about the amazing properties of water. And I said, yeah, I said, and I, I just started talking about how much I love water and just the properties of it. Look, water is one of those things that I've worked with, I've dealt with so much in my life that I just, I know it's just one of those things where I know there's many undiscovered things that we have not found, that we could use water for, that water can do, all these different things. It just, it's just so amazing. I mean, water um, has the highest specific heat of any liquid on the planet. This is what I was telling um, Brother Luke. And I said, literally anything that we can, you think about things that we can make better. You think about the refineries. We can take oil out of the ground and we can refine it into all these different products. We can add things to it, we can take away things from it, we can distill things from it, and we can make it into this great product that can be used for so many different things. But there's literally nothing we can do to water that, that doesn't make it worse. There is no better storage of energy in liquid form than just pure water. Anything we try to add to it, anything we try to to change it a little bit makes it worse. And Brother Luke said, that sounds like the Bible. That sounds like the words of God. I'm like, what a great analogy. That the, the Word of God is pure. Anything that man tries to do to the Word of God, I, I, I got to give him props for this. It's like, this is such a great analogy. Anything just like water, anything that we try to do to the Word of God makes it worse. Take away from it, change it, add to it, just makes it worse. It's pure in its form that God wrote it in. But the point is, go back to, just go, think about just water for a second and what God is doing to the earth here. Think about, I mean, there's your body, there's, I mean, think about agriculture. Where's agriculture without water? 
It's over. That's where it is. Agriculture without water is over. That's one of the biggest like political, you know, strifes in this great state that we live in here. It's just like water, who gets it? Where do we get it from? All these different things. You think about, um, think about industry. Industry without water, done. It's over. Think about every single industrial revolution that we've had. We've had, I think, I think we're counting five at this point. But think about the industrial revolutions that we've had. And just think about the importance of water. What was the first industrial revolution? What was the, what was the machine that, that was invented that started the first industrial revolution? It was the steam engine. That's what started like this mechanization in the, uh, what was it, like the late 18th century, something like that? That started the mechanization, that's the first industrial revolution. The second industrial revolution was the, the advent of uh, electric generation and the electrification of industry itself. And this was in the, you know, the early, early 20th century, I suppose the late, late 19th century. But guess what you need to make electricity? Water in almost every single case. And back in that time, it was 100% water. Water is used in, in, even today, in electric generation, like 85% of the, the electric generation in the entire world uses water as, it, as, a, as its working fluid. I'm not just talking about hydro plants. That's a very small, but thermal plants of all kinds use water. You think about the third industrial revolution, used electricity. It was the, you know, the, in the 1960s, 70s, the advent of the silicon transistor. The, the, you know, the this computer generation is called the third um, industrial revolution. The fourth one was an information revolution. I think they call that the internet, right? We're tr all trying to take a break from in, in the month of June, all right? And then I think the fifth one, and I, this might be a little debatable, but the fifth one, people are saying that artificial intelligence is going to be a fifth um, industrial re revolution. We'll see. So far, it's just a a fancy search tool that gives you the wrong answers a lot of times. So we'll see how that goes, all right? But the point is this, without water, none of this is going on. Without water, what God is doing here is, what is he doing? He's stopping everything here. He's stopping everything. Yes, animals died. Yes, people in the sea died. But what he's doing, he's literally cursing the earth. It, you know, everything, not just our lives and our sustainability of ourselves as, you know, human beings, but all of our activity revolves around the seas, the waters, the fountains, the water on the earth. It's literally the most amazing substance uh, on the earth. It's proof of God. It's proof of God. I mean, and God uses it. God uses it again and again and again. One thing I, one thing I think about, you know, I, you know, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but like every single molecule of water, a glass of water, whatever, like, I don't know, that's been used for I don't know how many different things. I mean, even just, even just in one year, the water that we receive down the San Joaquin River, it's probably been through like five or six turbine blades generating electricity. And then it goes out, and the Bible even talks about how, you know, it's distilled back up into the mountains, and God's got this great water cycle the Bible talks about. It's just an amazing thing. Pure water is the best at everything. All right? So look, God is cursing. God is essentially taking this away with the second trumpet and the third trumpet and the second vial and the third vial. So this is God's judgment on the earth and waters. So what I want to talk about tonight is like here we see God himself. Here we see God himself. I want you to think about the day and age that we live in. And in the Bible here towards the, the end of Daniel's 70th week, we're seeing that God himself is poisoning or polluting the, the entire earth and its life-giving qualities. God himself is doing this. Now I think if you went and you took... A, a gallon of diesel fuel or something like that and you went and you poured that into a lake in California and somebody caught you doing that, you would probably be in more trouble than if you actually killed somebody. But here you see God poisoning and literally polluting on purpose the life-giving water of the entire earth. I mean, it's a, it, it would be considered an environmental catastrophe 
what we're talking about here. All right, and before, before I get into what I'm about to say, let me just say that for years and years of my life, I spent in the research and development of environmental technologies and developing these things, put them in, put, putting them into practice, things that have changed the face of, you know, the way we control pollution in this country. So don't, you know, hear what I'm about to say and be like, oh, Pastor Pizarnsky wants to destroy the earth. No, that's not what I'm saying, okay? But the point is this. It's an interesting question to apply to today. It's an interesting thing to look at and apply to what we're being told today by supposed environmentalists. You know, the question is, should we destroy the earth? That's, that's what everyone's saying today. We're going to destroy the earth. How about this question? Can we destroy the earth? Can we destroy the earth? Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Turn to Genesis chapter number 1. What is the difference between what we're being told today and the biblical truth of the environment, the earth, how, you know, how robust is this thing, how much can we control? Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 28. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 28. God literally gives us direction on how to handle the earth, folks. And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. He's Sending them out of the garden into where? Into the earth. Replenish the earth and subdue it. So he says, first of all, be fruitful and multiply. Remember that as we go forward here in the next few minutes. He's saying, go out there and just have as many kids as you can. And then the Bible, other places, talks about how children are in heritage from the Lord. They're a blessing. Go out there and just have kids. That's what he's saying. Just populate the earth. And, and look at this. And subdue it. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So we have dominion over the animals, folks. They don't have dominion over us. That's not really the point of the sermon. But when it comes to the earth itself, there is this word used that says we are to subdue the earth. What does that mean? Subdue the earth means to control it. Subdue the land, in many cases, people would define as to cultivate it, to use it. That's what subdue means. Use its resources. Use what has been given to us. See, I believe that God put those resources in there. I don't believe that, here's another you know, crazy one. I don't believe oil came from dinosaurs. Sorry. You know, where, where the dinosaurs are 10 miles underneath the earth. I mean, how did that happen in you know, 4,000, 5,000 years or whatever it was? You know, I mean, how many dinosaurs were there? Think about that. You ever think about that? Like, how many, I mean, there's like, every time we turn around, you know, we got people alarm us out there. We're going to run out of oil. We just keep finding more oil. Yeah. Just keep finding more and more and more. Like, how many dinosaurs was it just like, were there dinosaurs just like stacked upon each other, like across the whole earth? It doesn't make any sense, Amen. folks. These resources were put here for us. So we could subdue and use these resources. The Bible clearly teaches stewardship, not worship, when it comes to the earth. Okay? And look, there, I'm not saying, look, I, I have been involved in fixing environmental problems. I'm not saying that there are no environmental problems, that things don't happen. But what I am saying is that, and I'll give you some examples. I mean, I mean just the last couple days, here, there's been some fires somewhere, I don't know where they were, but you can hardly see the mountains. Because there's smoke, it's, it's particulate, it's pieces of ash. It's actually pieces of solid particles floating in the air. And look, these are from natural fires or not natural, I don't know if they're natural fires or not. But the point is, is that ash in the air, smoke from wildfires, whatever. I mean, go and look up pictures of Los Angeles in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. You will not believe it. It is crazy. You can't even see the buildings in some of these, in some of these pictures. Look, I'm not saying that's not a problem. But what I'm saying is these problems that are local and regional are not going to destroy the earth. Smog in Los Angeles is not going to destroy the earth. Look at what God is doing to the earth in Revelation chapter 8 and Revelation chapter number 16. He already burnt up 
a third of the trees, and all of the grass. All of it. I wonder what it looks like in Fresno at that moment, <laughs> where the air doesn't move at all. So look, these are problems. And look, smog in cities like that, it causes real health problems. I mean, it causes asthma, like chronic bronchitis. All these things are, are real things. But it is real and it is local to that area. That basin with just 10 million people or whatever it is all packed into that area. Yeah, it's a problem, but guess what? We invented pollution controls and it was fixed. And I don't want to get political, but I believe that problem would have been fixed even if the government didn't force the fix. I believe the market would have fixed that problem because people would have been like, this smells, my eyes are burning, let's fix this, right? But look, here's another good one, just trash. I can't stand trash. I mean, one of the things that just like, I mean, you drive by this beautiful orchard and someone just dumped a, tr pick up load of trash right out in front of it. I'm just like, what in the world? It's so unclean. It's so, you know, irresponsible to just be throwing garbage all over the place. I used to hate haying ditches with garbage everywhere in it. People that didn't live there would come there and just throw beer cans in the ditches and they would end up in hay bales and just, what a, what a mess. But guess what? Trash is not going to destroy the earth. Trash is not going to destroy the earth. I mean, there's, these are local, regional problems. They are not earth-crushing issues. Even things that, that people looked at like as major disasters. How many of you were old enough to remember the Exxon Valdez? The Exxon Valdez, I, I think that was in the 80s, if I remember. But I remember that, and I remember the pictures of like the birds covered in oil and, and all that stuff. Look, that's not good. That's not a good thing. And then in 2010, there was the Exxon Valdez spilled in Alaska. It spilled like 11 million barrels of oil. Like this, this tanker ran, um, ran aground. I don't know if it was, it was barrels or gallons. I can't remember, but it's a lot. But in 2010, the Deepwater Horizon failed and exploded in the Gulf of Mexico, and it dumped like 20 times what the Exxon Valdez did into the Gulf, straight into the Gulf of Mexico. Like 210, 220, you know, million barrels of oil, or I, I'm, I'm getting, I don't know if it's barrels or gallons, but a lot of oil, my point is, like one of the, the biggest oil spill in the history of whatever. But you know what happened? Yes, there was some oil that washed up on beaches and it wasn't a good thing, okay? I'm not saying that's a good thing and we should do that. But most of the oil, they don't even know where it went. They can't even account for it. You know what, you know what the scientists finally came up with where the majority of it, they said like 20, I mean, they, they gathered some up and burned some of it, very small percentage. They skimmed some of it off, another very small percentage, like less than 5%. But 25% of it like foamed up from the ocean water and evaporated, 25% of it. And the rest of it, they believe that the ocean ate it. I'm serious. I mean, that's a simple way of putting it, but basically the microbes in the warm ocean water just broke down the oil and just ate the oil. And some of it probably went to the ocean floor, they think, but they think the vast majority of it, the point is, it did not destroy the earth. It did not even destroy the Gulf of Mexico. The earth is resilient. The earth is resilient. And look, is God not proving that? in Revelation here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really prove it to you at the end of the sermon. All right, but look at Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 22. You know I love this verse. The earth took care of itself. God is going to end the creation, this earth, not us. That is the biblical point that I'm trying to make. The Bible says here in Revelation, uh, not Revelation, Genesis 8 verse number 22, after the flood, God says this. He says, while the earth remaineth. That means until I give you a new one. That's what he means. He says, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So again, the Bible teaches, the Bible is teaching us, and it's also showing us from our, just our, our understanding and things that we can see around us, that the Bible is teaching stewardship, not earth worship. 
Stewardship. I mean, let's just give a, a we have a farmer in the, in the church. Let's give a farming example. And my father-in-law talks about this all the time. I, I'm going to reference my father-in-law several times um, tonight. I hope he wouldn't mind. But just take a, a farmer in one generation that he's, he's a farmer. And I mean, this happens all the time, by the way. I've seen this so many times. I've seen this cycle go 180 degrees. A farmer, he just overgrazes everything. He just lets his cattle or his sheep or whatever just chew everything down to the dirt. There's a lot of people that do it in California. I notice it all the time here. I don't know why. But they just chew it down. It's like there's no grass left. He overgrazes everything. He doesn't rotate his crops. He just pushes his land as hard as he possibly can just to get that, that one crop that one year and just abuses the land again and again. He's a poor steward, even with wildlife on his land. He'll, he shoots every duck, he shoots every pheasant, he shoots at every deer that's on his property. But guess what? That farmer's going to have local consequences to what he's doing. The first thing is he will be broke. My father-in-law used to always say, take care of the land and the land will take care of you. And what he's saying is, be a good steward. You know, be a good steward of the resources that God has put there for you. So he's going to abuse the land, and the land's just not going to produce the next year. That grass isn't going to come back if you just beat it down to that level. It's not going to give you grass and protein every single year if you abuse it that way. It's not going to work. He's going to go broke. He's going to have to sell all his cattle in two years. And all the wildlife, guess what? They're, they're, gonna, they're gone. They're going to leave. Because you just shoot at everything you see, they're just going to leave. They know. I don't know how they know, but they must talk to each other because they know. You ever go to a wildlife refuge? Like, they know. They know that they're safe there. All the pheasants and the birds and the deer, they know. I mean, you go to a campground in Monterey, California, the deer literally just walk right up to you. They know. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. But it's true. They know. Look, farmers that... Then, on the other hand, you get farmers that they don't allow, or they're good stewards of the wildlife that come on their property. They feed the wildlife on their property. They keep that wildlife alive through hard winters on their property. Garrett and I used to go turkey hunting at my father-in-law, on my father-in-law's ranch, and he was such a good steward of the wildlife there. I, I feel bad telling this story, because like turkey hunting is one of those, if you've ever seen people turkey hunt, it's really hard to turkey hunt guys are like they're all camoed up and they're all like doing these the call is super hard to do like it's this little reed and you got to get it just right and the turkeys because you got to get these turkeys to come close within shotgun range or even if you're bow hunting you got to get them within 15 yards 20 yards whatever it is and it's really hard to do lots of guys go out turkey hunting and they just they don't get a turkey year after year because it's one of the hardest things out there to sneak up on and hunt they're you know I hate to say they're smart but they're smarter than you know, hunters many times. My father-in-law was such a good steward of, of the wildlife on his place. He's just like, this was our turkey hunting experience. He's like, just go sit behind that hay bale over there and they'll, be, they'll walk by at 2.30. And, and I felt, I told Garrett, like, I kind of feel bad about this. This doesn't even feel like a sport because we sit behind this hay bale and sure enough, they just walk by at 2.30 and there we get our turkey. And like they just didn't even see it come. But he's such a good steward. He, he shoots, he allows his grandson to shoot one turkey a year and his other grandson to shoot one turkey a year and the rest of it. He's just feeding and just letting turkeys grow and, and have a habitat on his property. He's what? He's a good steward. He's a good steward of uh, his property. So the first guy, he goes broke. He has to sell out. He's wrecked. I mean, this is the, the farm you drive on. I don't know if you've ever driven on a, onto a, a place like this. It's just destroyed. The farmstead's full of trash. Nothing's ever been picked up. Just broken down machinery everywhere. His orchard's got weeds everywhere in it. I mean, we drive by. I point this out when we see, or you see nice groomed orchards with beautiful trees, and then you drive by another orchard, and you're like, bad farmer. But look, the bad farmers, first of all, he's rare. It's not the majority of farmers. The bad farmer, the poor steward, is rare, number one. But guess what? He goes broke, he sells out, then somebody comes in and just turns the place around. Cleans it up. I mean, the land wasn't destroyed forever. The wildlife, what? They all come back in like a season or two. They all tell their buddies like, hey, new ownership. You know, let's head over there. It's cool again. 
the animals come back. It's just poor stewardship. It's not destroying the planet. It's not destroying the world. So what, don't let anybody, and, and most people, by the way, most farmers in the example that I gave you are good stewards. It's, it's rare in, in my experience that you get somebody that just abuses everything and just trashes everything. That's a rare thing. Most people want to take care of things because guess what? It's in the farmer, it's in your own interest to do that, to take care of things so you can not just make money this year, but you can support your family and sustain things and all that, right? So don't let anyone convince you that because there are certain problems, again, it's, it's just like this morning. It's like painting with too broad of a brush. Oh, there's a problem there. We've got some smog here. Let's, like, we're going to destroy the whole world with this. No, we're not, is what I'm trying to get you to see. Look, God is wrecking the place here in Revelation chapter number 8 and Revelation chapter number 16. God is just, he's tearing it up. But it's his to tear up, first of all. But we are not going to be able to do that. I mean, think about all the global alarm scenarios that we've already seen that we can look back that were false. In the 60s, it was overpopulation. It's like we're going to be overpopulated and we're all going to starve to death. Even though the Bible said, be fruitful and multiply. You think God would have warned us? God would have given us like a cap if we we're all just going to starve to death by listening to his command, all right? Look, the, the major problem now is population decline. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Population collapsing, because nobody's having children anymore, so they're all worried like the economies are gonna collapse, and how, who's gonna make all the stuff that we're all so accustomed to, to using and needing, needing, right? So look, overpopulation in the 60s, false. Never happened. As a matter of fact, we just got more productive. The more people that came on the scene, the more production there was. Technologies come on the scene. I mean, it's just false. The ozone hole, you remember this one? I mean, if you're, if you're my age, you remember this one. I was terrified of this as a kid. They're like in the 80s, it was like there's a hole in the ozone layer. I was terrified. I was like, we're all going to get sunburned to death and die of skin cancer. This is what I thought as a kid. It's like on the news, it's just like the ozone hole and the ozone layer is going away. And I'm like, what's the ozone layer? And they're like, it's the thing that protects us from the sun. And without it, we all just burn up. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> then you get, real, you get sunburned real bad and like your nose is peeling and you're just like, oh, I'm dead. But guess what happened with the ozone layer? The, the funny thing about the ozone layer, if you live through that, it just kind of went away. Like people just kind of stopped, like, they just kind of stopped talking about it, right? But the funny thing about the ozone layer, and we love, you know, refrigeration and refrigeration talk here. This is why we have refrigeration systems that operate at like 8,000 PSI or whatever it is, right? I'm just, I'm just joking, I'm exaggerating, but the point is, they got rid of all the CFCs that were supposedly, because it was your refrigerator that was destroying the ozone. It was your refrigerator, American. That's what it was. So they banned all those things. But here's the funny thing. If you go back and look at what actually happened, and like the Heritage Foundation, like real people have studied this and looked at, you know, what actually happened. The ozone layer stopped thinning in like 1990, 1991. But CFCs and all the refrigerants kept increasing all the way up to 1998. So like, what do we learn from this? What we learned from this is it was some kind of naturally occurring thing that solved itself, basically, all right? I mean, there's so many things like this. Acid rain, I was terrified of acid rain too. I mean, remember acid rain? I mean, it's gonna rain acid, are you kidding me? I mean, as, but here's the funny thing, acid rain is real. I actually worked to stop acid rain I, and I was, you know, I was involved in, in some of these technologies that acid rain is real for the local people that park in that parking lot. There's stories of guys that worked at the plants in the 70s and the 80s before they had scrubbers and they had these uh, systems to remove um, sulfuric acid and, and, you know, sulfur dioxide from the flue gas streams at coal-fired power plants especially, there was guys that worked there like, yeah, we park here, you know, in the 80s and like my paint job would only last for two years. Why? Because there's like literally sulfuric acid 
in the water that was dropping out of the stacks um, onto the paint on their car. It wasn't something that was burning your skin, but it was something that over time was acidic in the water and it hurt the paint on their car. But guess what? They solved all that. But it was never something that was going to destroy the planet, folks. It was never going to start, you know, raining acid across the world. Like they were saying, like, acid rain, ah! I mean, just think of our kids and what we're telling them. I mean, literally, when I left in 2016, farmers were wanting to come to the power companies and buy the, the scrubber um, sludge from those scrubbers so they could put the sulfur back on their fields as fertilizer. Because the paint on your car doesn't like it, but the plants do. The earth does. So it's just global alarmist after global alarmist after global alarmist. So just be careful when you know, people are telling you that you know, you're going to end the planet by buying a diesel pickup or whatever. All right? You know, I mean, Florida is going to, you know, you're going to flood Florida because you have a, a turbo diesel. So you just have to look back at the past. These are the same people that told you all these things that turned out to not be true. You know, they're kind of like prophets that said something that did not come to pass. Book of Deuteronomy, you probably shouldn't listen to them going forward. Let's go back to the Bible. All right, let's go back to the Bible. Let's go back to the Bible. Look at, um, no, so let's consider. Let's consider this. Uh, consider what we've seen so far. All right, in Revelation chapter number six, just look at your chart. Let's consider, let's, let's go even, let's back up even before the rapture. All right, you've got the Antichrist comes on the scene, makes a covenant with many. Then you've got the four horsemen in Revelation chapter number 6. What do the four horsemen do? The four horsemen are, you know, it's basically the Antichrist coming to global power is what the four horsemen are. And during the four horsemen in Revelation chapter number 6, the Bible says that basically two big things happen, right? There's this huge war where a quarter of people on the planet die. A quarter of people on the planet die, and, you know, I mean, that's got to be nuclear war. And, th and then there's massive starvation that it talks about as well. Food is super scarce and super expensive. This has already happened. As we're getting to this point where God now starts pouring out the vials. There's already been nuclear war. I mean, the place is a mess. There's been a war of some kind, it has to be nuclear in my opinion, that killed two billion people. I mean, that is a mess. But turn to Revelation chapter number 20. And then after this, after Revelation chapter 6, after the Antichrist comes to power, sets up the abomination of desolation, pours out the great tribulation on Christians. Christians are raptured out of here. Now God takes over and he starts, he burns up a third of the trees. He burns up all the grass. Then he burns up, uh, you know, he kills a third of the animals in the, in the sea. He wrecks a third of the ships and kills every living soul in the sea, which is every man in the sea. And look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, look at verse number one. I just want to read four verses here where the Bible says this. So you've got a picture of what the earth has gone through at this point, right? In Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Why is he binding Satan a thousand years? Because we're heading into the millennial reign of Christ. Okay? And shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, that's us, neither his image, neither received the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is us coming back to the earth to live and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. Let me ask you a question. Is there a new earth yet? <laughs> I mean, either the earth is resilient or we'd be all like, I don't really want to go back down there. I'm not thinking we're heading back and Jesus is going to rule like, you know, Mad Max, you know, um, earth 
for a thousand years. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking that the earth is resilient and that God will decide when the new earth comes. We're, Jesus is literally taking over the earth after all of this has happened. We haven't even talked about all of it yet. But it, it's, it's been, he's been wrecking the place. Man's been wrecking the place through this nuclear war. Jesus Christ, or God, has poured out this wrath that has burned up the place, poisoned the waters. But guess what? The waters must have healed themselves. They must have what? They must have distilled themselves. The water cycle must be continuing, and the earth is going on, even after this. So the point is this. The greatest hurt to the earth will be by God himself. So we should be, look, we should be a good steward. Don't, don't get me wrong. You should be a good steward of whatever it is that God has given you. You should be a good steward of your blessings. You should be a good steward of your home, your apartment, your house, whatever that is. You should be a good steward. You should teach your children to be a good steward. But that is so they can support themselves. They can, you know, leave something for the next generation to not have to clean up after them. And, you know, they can, you know, but po the point is, in the end, the earth is resilient. This is what the Bible is telling it. And we do not control its destruction. It's arrogant. It's arrogant. It's literally man thinking that we can be like the Most High. Amen. To say that we can come in. But you know what it really is? It's really a control mechanism. It's really a control mechanism. But we, and you're starting to see why all these globalists and all these wicked leaders and spiritual wickedness in high places, you're starting to see why they're not going to like the Bible-believing Christian. Because they're simply not able to control us. Because we have the Bible. So when they say, like, you got to, hey, we all have to go back to riding unicycles now, we say, no, because of the Bible. Because no, because my, my car is not going to destroy the earth. God is. That's God's realm, not ours. Be a good steward. And look, I can even understand a little bit people falling for some of this stuff. Just a little bit, though, if they don't believe the Bible. But honestly, there's so much history of the alarmism and the lies that just really any rational thinking person should be able to figure it out at this point. If you've been alive for two or three decades, you should be able to figure out because it's not, it's not that complicated of a puzzle. Just by looking at the lies, you've already been told. All right, so look, I just find it really interesting that Jesus Christ is taking over this same earth after all of this has happened. So don't let anyone scare you. Be a good steward. Take care of the blessings and the things that God has entrusted you with. But you know what? Use the resources that God has given you. That's why he put them here. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.